Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. Is it on? Okay. Great. So, uh, let yourself find a way to sit comfortably and listen uh, to these teachings. Um, not so much because you're supposed to remember them or there's a quiz or something, but to listen to see what they remind you of that you know to be true. Um, and if it seems wrong or doesn't seem true, then just let it go. But if it touches something of your own wisdom and reminds or supports or illuminates that, then that's, that's a benefit or a blessing. And so this evening, um, I want to continue a set of teachings that I'll be doing pretty much throughout the year um, on Buddha nature, and in particular what are called the, the Ten Perfections of the Human Heart. Um, and basically they're one of the many Buddhist recipes for human happiness. Um, and what's true about them is that they speak in a kind of timeless way to our experience. I have a poem here from Gabriela Mistral, great Chilean poet. She writes, a woman is singing in the valley. The shadows falling blot her out, but her song spreads over the fields. Her heart is broken, like the jar she dropped this afternoon among the pebbles in the brook. Does she sing for a husband who looks at her silently in the dusk, or for a child whom her song caresses? Or does she sing for her own heart more helpless than a babe at nightfall? Night grows maternal before this song that goes to meet it. The stars with a sweetness that is human are beginning to come out and the sky full of stars understands the sorrows of this world. Her song is pure as water, filled with light, cleanses the plain and rinses the mean air of the day in which men hate. And from the throat of this woman who keeps on singing, day rises nobly, evaporating toward the stars. And I read it, to bring in a sense of a rhythm that's so much bigger than our ordinary rhythm of life, the rhythm of the movement of the spheres and the turning of the seasons and the rise and fall of dynasties and the changes that we participate in that are much beyond our, our human doing. Um, and I, I wanted to do these teachings on the Paramitas this year particularly because we're living in these divided times and uh, confusing times politically and socially and, and in other ways. And it seemed important to come back to some ground of basic dharma or teachings of truth um, that are timeless um, and that we can rest in and use to understand how to act and live in the world in time of volatility and so much change. And so far we've talked about generosity, the first of them, which is really generosity of spirit. Um, and then we talked about the last time virtue, integrity, um, that if we don't have some fundamental integrity, we move through the world like a boat without a rudder thrown around by all the temptations and difficulties. Um, and all these are not, you're supposed to be virtuous or you should be generous. They're actually invitations to happiness. That this is a way for you to have a, a, a profound well-being of heart and spirit and mind. And the third of these qualities, and you might think, oh, what is he going to talk about? This one is nekama, which means renunciation. And you go, okay, happiness, renunciation, huh, how do those fit together? And particularly hard to understand in a society that teaches that accumulation is happiness, which is one of the big messages that we're part of. And yet we know 
when you go camping and you're there out in the Sierras in your little tent and and you have almost nothing but the cook stove and the freeze-dried food or whatever you brought up with you, um, some of the happiest times of your life are not encumbered by all the things of the world, but when you're here um, in a kind of presence with the rest of, of this mystery. Um, and you know, a couple of years ago, when, during the Occupy movement, um, which was really partly, I think, fueled by a, a vision or an understanding that we need to adjust the way our society is working because the inequality between very wealthy and very poor has, has brought suffering for, to a lot of people. And the, the capitalist system, as it works, needs some, needs some turning to understand also our responsibility toward one another in some way that's healthy. Um, but... Uh, Folks from the East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland um, during that period of time went out and they decided they were going to do a demonstration. And they picked one of the major banks um, that had been in Occupy and Wall Street where there was a lot of Occupy things, um, trying to make a statement about um, it's not so much about money and how much money a corporation or something can make, but how we use our money. Um, and so the, the, um, the meditation center's um, action was to go in front of one of the major banks in Oakland, stand there very peacefully, do some meditation, and give out a dollar to everyone that walked by. Said, all right, instead of taking your money, we're going to give you money. And it shocked people. Some people took it, some people didn't, some were quizzical. The bank locked the doors. Okay, there's protesters <laughs> out there. It was sort of frightened them. But they watched, and there were these people, very peaceful, giving away money. Finally, they ran out of dollars, and they needed change, and they knocked on the bank and held up like a $20 bill, and they opened the door, sure, we'll give you ones, and so forth. And they became like friends with the people inside the bank. So there's, you know, there's accumulation, and it has its place. But in our society, um, we've lost the sense of what really brings happiness. Let me ask you uh, then a, a simple question. How many of you would like to simplify your life? Look around, yeah. There are a few that don't raise their hands, but that's because they're shy, actually. <laughs> and when I lived as a monk, and with these monks and nuns, for the years that I did, it was very much a life of renunciation. You shave your head, you leave your home, you live with an alms bowl and very, very few things. And the idea is to shed those encumbrances in the, in the monastic order and pay attention to your own heart and how you live. And that's really what matters the most. Um, and there's a lot of teaching about renunciation for the monastics that we did. Um, you get the food that's put in your alms bowl that day, and some days you don't get food. And, okay, well, I trust that I'll get food tomorrow. And you do usually, so it's okay. Um, but you learn to live by a very different measure than what you have. And then you listen, okay, this is in the Buddha's teachings. Is this necessary for us, for liberation? Here we are householders, but we also don't just want to go to the temple and make some offering, as is common in the temples in Asia. People in the West are also very much interested in their inner liberation in the midst of their business and their household life and so forth. We, too, need renunciation. Text from the Buddha's teaching. Herein, what are the kinds of joy based on renunciation? When by knowing impermanence, change, that all things change, fading away, the cessation of all that arises, one sees the world as it actually is, impermanent, fleeting, like a star at dawn, like a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, an echo, a rainbow, a dream. And proper wisdom forms that all things are impermanent, ungraspable, not to find satisfaction that is lasting in them. And thus understanding great joy arises. Such joy is the joy based on deep understanding and renunciation. 
Okay, that sounds good in a certain way, but how does it apply to us? Here we live in a desire-based culture, mostly. Mae West said, I can resist anything but temptation, <laughs> right? And so I have my first audiovisual support for a Dharma talk here in the new hall. Um, uh, and if you, back in the uh, technological world there, can pull up this three-minute YouTube, let me tell you about it before they start. Um, there was a famous scientific experiment done by Walter Mischel um, a couple of decades ago or so, um, and the, the gist of it is that you take a young child and a marshmallow. You've heard of this, I'm sure. You put the marshmallow on the plate, you take the young child there, and you say, you can have it now, or if you just wait a bit, I'll be back and I'll give you two marshmallows, right? And it's basically determining whether that child can delay gratification. And from the social science point of view, what it showed was that the children who had developed somewhat of that capacity, in fact, succeeded much better in school or in relationships or work because they somehow were able to regulate themselves better. I really see this as the picture of somebody, what it's like when you're beginning to meditate and how hard it can be with all the storms and the different things that come to people. So uh, let's, it's a couple minutes. Um, uh, you can enjoy it whenever they pull it up. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Thank you. You can roll the screen up anytime. So there you have your meditation instruction for the night, right? And our human dilemma in some way. Um, now, the capacity that we have to notice the 
poles and the forces of liking and disliking and desire and fear and so forth, which are part of human life, they're really natural. Um, but the capacity that we have to step back, as we do with loving awareness, not to turn away from them, but also not to be as enthralled by them, not to be caught by them in some way, is what renunciation in this form is pointing to for us. It points to the, to the capacity that we have in the heart to be present for all of life, but not to get lost in it. And this is from a Chinese text. You monks who want to escape from all the various afflictions and you practitioners must contemplate what it means to know satisfaction. The practice of knowing satisfaction is the locus of prosperity, bliss, peace, and security. And even if they are lying on the ground, the people who know satisfaction are happy and at peace. But for the people who do not know satisfaction, it doesn't suit their fancy even if they're in heaven. The people who do not know satisfaction are poor even if they are rich. The people who do know satisfaction are rich even if they are poor. So it speaks to some fundamental reality in our lives about what is the state of the heart. And it doesn't mean that we can't build or create or act or lead. And the Buddha in his teachings taught both who, those who were poor, but he also spent time with the leaders, the princes and the kings and the wealthy merchants and so forth. And he gave teachings to everyone equally. Um, and he didn't say, oh, you should be this way or that. He was equally respectful of the merchants and those who are wealthy, but he said, here, here are teachings that, that really go to the heart of the matter. How do we as human beings become happy? So what does renunciation mean then for us as householders? It's a renunciation of the heart, and it's not simply that we don't possess or own things, but it speaks more to our attachment to them the wanting, the fear of loss, the grasping at the deepest level, addiction and greed. But even on a more superficial level, the desires that we get caught in can also blind us. Um, the saying in Indi India is that if a saint, um, sorry, if a pickpocket meets a saint, what he does is look to see what's in the saint's pockets, right? He doesn't see the saint at all. He just sees what he can grab. The filters that we use determine what the world looks like for us. And of course, there's that teaching in the Bible that says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven. Um, a friend of mine who's a biblical scholar said the eye of the needle is actually the name of a very small gate in the wall in the old city of Jerusalem. So it's not literally a needle, but it's the name of that that you sort of have to duck to go in as a human being and no camel can get through. So, but there's some way of saying in it that um, it's our attachments that can bind us and keep us from, the, from what it means to have satisfaction or or that inner sense of joy or heaven or abundance. Um, and in the Zen, they put it this way, how refreshing, the whinny of a pack horse unloaded of everything. My teacher Ajahn Chah used to say, if you let go a little bit, you'll be a little bit happy. If you let go a lot, you'll be a lot happy. If you really let go, then everything will be easy for you. Now, what does it mean to renounce? There's the renunciation of the physical things, stuff, basically. And you all know this. I mean, I remember seeing this cartoon of two kind of cavemen. Um, one was with their kind of skins on and one was carrying a club. And one says to the other, this whole thing has gotten out of hand. I say we stop wearing clothes and talking before it's too late, you know. Um, but our stuff can take over our life. And you know what the joy is of clearing out the attic. 
you know, or the closet, or giving things away, or, or simplifying in some fashion or other, the joy that comes of simplicity. Um, my colleague and friend Joseph Goldstein, who's another very wonderful and well-known meditation teacher, um, he practiced for a long time in India, in Bodh Gaya, uh, where the tree of the Buddha's enlightenment, that great temple is, is, and he invited his mother, who lived in upstate New York, to come and practice with him. And she came for a month from a very comfortable home in the mountains in upstate New York and, you know, relative prosperity, and lived in a little hut that was part wood and part concrete with a cement floor and a little cot in it, and you had to go outside to the toilet in the monastery yard um, and sit down on the floor with these people when you got your food um, twice a day. And she said that it was the happiest time in her life. I mean, the teachings were beautiful, the spirit of the people there were beautiful, but there was also something about just living, like camping, I said, living with that level and that kind of simplicity. So in the end, our happiness is not what we have or don't have. It's not saying you should get rid of things, um, but our ability to be present for life as it is rather than wanting and grasping and, and, and so forth. The, the great Zen poet Ryokan writes, where are we, Ryokan? My life may appear melancholy, but traveling through this world, I've entrusted myself to heaven. In my sack, three quarts of rice, by the hearth, a bundle of firewood. If someone asks what is the mark of enlightenment or illusion, I cannot say. Wealth and honor, praise and blame arise and pass like the weather. As the evening descends, I return to my hermitage and stretch out both feet in answer. My answer is, here we are. It's a beautiful way. Now, um, some years ago, my friend Duane Elgin, who's also a Dharma practitioner, wrote a book called Voluntary Simplicity, I think in the 70s or 80s. It's hard to remember quite when it came out. Um, and most people wanted to simplify. You raise your hand. But it's not also that easy. You know, and I know from living in villages and places where it was very simple, there was something really um, refreshing about that simplicity. Uh, Thoreau says the soul grows by subtraction, not by addition. That when you simplify in certain ways, outwardly and inwardly, you can listen in a new way. Of course, even when you simplify, the habit of clinging is there. So I noticed in my monastic life that a monk friend of mine had a, had a very cool set of robes that came from the um, garments that they were using in funerals. They were sort of the special robes because you were like a really cool monk if you had these old funeral robes and things like that. And I looked and said, gee, I wonder when I'm going to get robes like that, you know. And he had a really nice alms bowl, and mine was not all that nice. And you start to see how it is. It doesn't matter where you are. That desire thing starts to work. Mm. But you want to reflect. What is it time to let go of or to hold lightly? And it's not about poverty, because the Buddha again says in one of these wonderful texts, he says... Um, well, here's the, I'll read it to you. Uh, a wealthy businessman said to the Buddha, I see you're the awakened one and would like to open my mind and heart and ask your advice. My life is full of work. I employ many people who depend on me to be successful. I enjoy my work and like working hard, but having heard your followers talk of the bliss of renunciation and seeing you as a homeless one, should I do the same? I long to do what is right. And the Buddha replied, the bliss of a truth-seeking life is attainable for anyone who follows the path of unselfishness. If you cling to your wealth, it's better to throw it away than let it poison your heart. But if you don't cling to it and use it wisely, then you will be a blessing to people. It's not wealth and power that enslave us, but the clinging to them. And the 
truth is that you don't get to keep it anyway. Right? You have it for a certain time. It's sort of like you're the accountant in the firm. You take care of it and you pay your taxes on it or you, you know, tend it or whatever it is. And then at some point you have to give it up. The real question is, does it possess you? And then not only does it possess us in some way, but if we look in our society, does it possess us collectively? Remember, everybody knows the passage from Eisenhower at the end of his presidency, where he says, every gun that's made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense, a theft from those who are cold and not clothed. The world in armaments is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in its true sense. It is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. And so here we are in the richest nation on earth. Um, Emerson says the, the, wis the wisdom of nations is shown by what they do with their surplus capital. How, what, how do we use the wealth that was given to us? And, you know, if we look in a certain way, we're also sadly a warlike nation. And I can count, I don't know, dozens of wars that we've been in, big and small, in my own lifetime. Pretty much not many years between them. The little ones like Grenada or Panama or, you know, or there's Libya or there's many, many, many. And then, of course, there are all the other wars elsewhere. But we also supply the majority of armaments to the world more than any other country. And then we worry that we're not safe. Uh, there might be some connection between those two. So we start to reflect on this, again, not to make a political statement or to favor one political point of view or another, but to look at what, what benefits humanity from the deepest place. Um, and I remember being in New Delhi, and along the river... Um, is, the, is a great big park, a, a, an open expanse with some stone, uh, stone walls on the side inscribed with the sayings of Gandhi. It's a memorial to Gandhi um, and where his body was cremated. Um, and on one of them there's a famous phrase from Gandhi where it says, before you act, think of the poorest person you've met and consider if your next act will be of any benefit to them? It's a really kind of powerful question to consider what is our relationship to others. And I just came from a conference at UCLA this last weekend that was on consciousness and mind and human well-being. And it had neuroscientists and physicists and psychologists and um, uh, various teachers of of different kinds, and it was really quite quite a wonderful conference. My favorite presentation there was from a woman named Alyssa Eppel. She works at UC Medical Center here. She's a professor there, and she works together with Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering telomeres, those caps on the ends of your chromosomes that protect you from aging. Um, and when they start to fray and diminish, then the cells start to die, and eventually your body dies. So, um, but it turns out, one of the things that Alyssa's research showed, um, and she couldn't believe it, she did it several times, and then she published it, and no one else believed it until they redid it, was that if you meditate for a time, for some weeks, they can measure that your cells, that the telomeres in your cells actually repair themselves more. And they get, you, you, your life is extended or you get healthier cells and it's measurable. So that was already a kind of wild finding that she could hardly believe, but it's been replicated a lot. Um, but the thing that she said that was much newer and, and interesting, and I have to read the research because I don't know how they, how they factored for all the other confounding factors, she said, your cells are listening to the world. Um, and we can, she said, we can see it as geneticists in the epigenetics of your cell. Certain things get activated or turned on or turned off depending on the hormones in your body and the level of stress um, 
on, or the level of well-being. Um, we're, we're, we're tuned to those around us and to the environment. And the particular thing that she measured um, was that in places or societies where there's a very big differential between um, the wealthiest and the poorest of that population, obviously those who are poor have more stress and their telomeres get frayed because there's not enough food or there's um, people shooting around them or, or whatever the kind of um, suffering that racism and poverty and, and so forth bring to their lives. But it turns out that in those same areas or countries that the people who are wealthy, their telomeres also shorten as if somehow their body and their cells, even if it's not conscious, they may feel guilty about having a lot of money or they may not, however, but somehow our bodies are tuned to the matrix of the humanity around us. And so their lifespan is also shorter because the lifespan of the people around them is shorter. And it's a kind of wild piece of research that points to interdependence. So when Gandhi says, think of the poorest person you've met and consider if your next act will be of benefit to them, it turns out that them is us and we're, we're in the family together. So one dimension of renunciation is renunciation to the attachment of things, renunciation from greed, so that what you have is both appropriate and it's used in a beautiful way and that's what makes the heart happy. And otherwise, you're not so happy. Now, renunciation of the second kind is the renunciation of the possession of others. That is to say, people being possessed. Um, and to the extent that you try to possess or control your lovers, your spouse, your children, your parents, you know, whoever it is, first of all, they don't like it. You may have noticed that, you know. Um, and it's generally not a very successful strategy. And of course, I remember when my daughter was first learning to drive, and there she was, 15 or 16, and that terrifies every parent, and it should. Um, and then this guy came who was from the driving school and said, get in, let's head out toward the freeway. And I'd given her lessons like in a parking lot. I said, you're going to take her on the freeway? And he said, oh, the girls are easy. It's the boys I worry about. But anyway, we'll leave that aside for the moment. Um, all I could do was pray, you know, that's it, you know, okay, she's going to do her best and here's a, here's a car and see, that's all you can do. And in the end, that's pretty much all that you can do anyway <laughs> with our kids or with the people that we care about. Mostly in the end, what we can do is love them. Ursula Le Guin, love doesn't just sit there like a stone. It has to be made like bread, remade all the time, made new. And that love is not a possessive love because that's not really love, but the renunciation of the grasping of how they should be. Now, I'm about to go off to the East Coast in a day or so to be with my twin brother who's in the last weeks of his um, cancer of myelofibrosis and leukemia and stuff, and he's called hospice. And... Um, I've been going back and forth, and I'm very close to him, and my other brothers will all be there. Um, and uh, I had some ideas about what might be the right good thing for him in terms of hospice and how he might die peacefully and so forth. But it turned out, of course, he had some ideas. And his family had ideas, and the family's ideas were not even necessarily his ideas. And I could see you know, from all my experience and thought, this might be really good, but it's not my place to determine that. People die in character, and they, they die as they lived, and they die in the circumstance of the people that they're with, and I might have some idea, but it turns out that, you know, basically the game is to go and love people as they are. And there's a deep kind of renunciation in, in this, um, here, let me read you a story from, I told you Frank Ostaseski is going to come and teach with me in, in, in uh, some next month. Um, and this is a story from his wonderful new book called The Five Invitations. 
Let me see if I can find the... Oh, there's one. Come on. Mm -hmm. I'll find it. You can meditate while I look, you know, hey, or not, as you like. You could be impatient, whatever you want, you know. Um, there's a good story, but it's not the right one. Oh, I thought I had... Oh, here it is. Okay. So, um, this is talking about someone who has Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and she was finally unable to live on her own, this woman, and so one of her daughters brought her into her home and tried to create a place where she could live. Not long after bringing her mother with dementia to live with her, Jillian, as the woman, walked into the living room to find her beloved books, and Jillian was a writer who had these bookcases full of all the classics and things she's loved including her sacred Buddhist texts and her favorite antique books, scattered across the floor. Her mother announced, I'm tired of all these dusty old books. I'm going to give them to my dentist. <laughs> now, Jillian was momentarily trapped by rage. She scolded her mother's assistant or attendant who was there all day taking care of her. How could you let her do this? How could you let this happen? And the attendant, who was not caught in the whole drama, replied, ma'am, Today I pack the books up, and tomorrow I will unpack them. If this gives a sense of control to a woman who has lost so much, well then, it's okay with me. It doesn't matter so much. I just like being with her. How's that? We have so many ideas about how it's supposed to be. And here, okay, I'll pack the books up and I'll unpack them, because it's really the presence of love that matters and not where the books are. And so that you can feel the kind of deep renunciation that comes in this dimension. And also what's true is that you can do it. You might think you can't. And I remember I was at Esalen years ago. I had brought for a program um, a number of Buddhist teachers there, Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche and Tartang Tulku and Lama Govinda and all these kind of Buddhist luminaries. And we were all teaching together with uh, Stan Groff and... Um, and so forth. And um, one of the people I brought was a Korean Zen master named uh, Sun San, or San Sanim, as we used to call him. And some of the folks at Esalen got really enamored of his teaching. He was a wonderful Zen teacher, Korean Zen teacher. Um, and this couple who was there, you know, became students of his, and he came back another time, and they were very devoted. And then they broke up. You know how it is, and they were young, but you don't have to be young to break up, but there it is. And it, um, and it was not easy at all, um, and the woman left him for somebody else, and the man was just disconsolate. And I watched the Zen master, and he was very tender with this guy, and he said, you know, he touched him on the heart, difficult, pulled it all with compassion. Nice, you know, lovely kind of response. Then he went and he traveled for about eight months, Korea and various temples, and he came back. And I happened to be there when he returned, and these people were there. And there was this group, and there was this, what had been his disciples in this couple that, you know, now had separated. Um, she was with some other guy, and, and the Zen master met this man and looked at him and said, how are you? And he said, oh, still terrible. It's just such loss, still feels so bad. And so he said, oh, I have a gift for you. And he opened his ba monk's bag and he pulled out this beautiful set of beads. And he said, here, give me your hands. And he put the beads in his hands and he held them with one hand. And they looked him in the eye and he smacked him across the face. And he shouted, he said, let her go. And we were all like, ha, ah. you know. I, I didn't learn this in therapy training, right? It might have been a good move, but they don't, you know. And the guy was like, shocked. But I'll tell you, a week later, he was done. He just finished it. All right, I get it. 
so you hear these teachings and you think, oh yeah, nice for the Buddha or those monks or something, but it actually is possible for you. And to know that, um, not that you deny it and that you don't feel the grief and so forth, which originally the Zen master said, yes, I feel compassion, that's painful. But now it's time to start anew. And renunciation is not possessing people and not pos even in yourself, not possessing the way that's supposed to be. And then you're free to move with a, a wise relationship. Now, um, third kind of renunciation, particularly helpful in these times, is the renunciation of views just in case you have them, and opinions. And the Buddha says, well, in the Tao it says, the philosopher is wedded to his opponent. You know, they like it, and that's okay, that's a kind of nice thing. But the Buddha says, but those who cling to their views go about the world annoying others. Right, that's his, I think he laughed when he said that, you know. And half our opinions are really based on fear and misunderstanding anyway, and they change periodically. Um, but we get so filled with what's right and the way things are supposed to be, whether it's uh, political or spiritual or, or, or any other way. Um, and then we start to carry, you know, our anger and our grudges and our perspective. And it, in some way, it, it undermines the heart. And we're full of judgment. I hate to say it. I wish it weren't true. But your judge judging part, at least those of you who have a strong judging part, it's been in there since you're a kid and it follows you around and it kind of knows you and says, oh yeah, she's not doing that right and you could do that better. It's just in there, you know, and no matter how good things go, it's like here's Dustin Hoffman, he says, a good review from the critics is just another stay of execution, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, you can't really let yourself be happy because the judge is in there in some way. Um, and the thing about views is that you believe them, but they're really only partial. Truth is not given to us in words, um, and in fact, um, being right, and everybody's heard that, too, would you rather be right or happy, basically. So it doesn't mean that you can't have perspectives and values um, and carry, carry them, um, but it's the grasping of them and believing that you have the right way and that you really see it. Who knows politically what's going to happen? Who knows spiritually what's going to happen? Um, who knows what's going to happen in your life? Don't know mind, which is what the Zen master San Sanim called it, Suzuki Roshi called it beginner's mind, is to be willing and able to see things in a fresh fashion. And we need that. Perhaps we need that now more than ever. Peter Matheson writes, Eventually, the child's clear eye and heart is clouded over by ideas and opinions, preconceptions and abstractions. Simple, free, joyful being becomes encrusted with the burdensome armor of who we should be and how we think we should be. Not until years later does an instinct come that some vital sense of mystery has been withdrawn. The sun glints through the pines, and the heart is pierced in a moment of beauty and strange pain, like a memory of paradise. And after that day, we become seekers. There's something about the child of the spirit in you, no matter what views and what you've lived through, something inviolable that can be touched when we let go of views and step more into the mystery of life. So you can reflect on that as well. Um, Spiritual views. People come and say, my partner doesn't meditate. So what? <laughs> Maybe you're the one that needs it, you know? <laughs> oh. Thomas Merton wrote, the beauty of saints is not their sanctity or holiness. This is not what makes a saint holy. What makes a saint holy is the gift that they're given, the gift of sainthood, which is to see the beauty in everyone else. That's what it means. So this is a different kind of renunciation, the renunciation of your views and so forth, to really honor and 
And again, I mean, even in the practice of metta, which I send everywhere, political leaders everywhere, some you like, some you don't, whatever your views are, may they be free from hatred, you know? May they live with a, a, a heart of compassion. I wish that for them, for every single one, the ones that I might agree with or don't in my own opinions. Um, now that's something I could really wish for everyone. I have a friend actually who used to be, um, you see how far I have to go here, I'll tell this story. Um, he went on a vision quest and he was a sort of an angry guy who got into conflict with people because he had a lot of views and opinions, one of those type people, not unlike some people we know, myself and others. Anyway, he went on this vision quest and he thought, it was 10 days at uh, Four Corners, way out in the desert in the southwest, and very special. And he was alone in you know, his little canteen and whatever. And he's going on and on, day after day, and looking for some vision, and no vision came. And it's coming to the last day, and he goes around the corner, and he sees a rock to sit down, and he just sits down on this rock. And somewhat disillusioned, disappointed, I came out here to have a vision, no vision came, you know, maybe I'm not so spiritual, whatever the judgment inside says. And then he noticed that a little ways in front of him were some animal bones, deer bones. And then he looked more closely and it was sort of odd the way they were configured. And then he looked even more closely and what he saw was two sets of antlers entangled that during the rutting time or whatever, these two deer with antlers had butted heads and somehow locked their antlers together and been unable to get them apart and eventually had died. And he said, okay, vision's come. <laughs> <laughs> and now I see it was the perfect vision that he needed to understand the conflict that he was having that he created in his life and how being in that, in his views and conflicts, actually kept him locked in with these people and so forth. So you can understand the Buddha's teaching about happiness. Not that we don't see clearly and have discriminating wisdom and understand what our values are, but the attachment we know, and this is true, it's only temporary, that view, and there are other views. No matter what your view is, there's another view and another angle to see it from. Ah. Renunciation of being right. Mm. Letting things go. This is again from the Buddha. Look how he abused me and beat me. He threw me down and robbed me. Perpetuate such thoughts and you live in hatred. Look how he abused me and beat me, threw me down and robbed me. Abandon these thoughts and live in love. In this world, hate never ends by hatred, but by love alone is healed. This is the ancient and eternal law. So here's something pretty serious. It's not like, oh, they dissed me or they, you know, they were, you know, emotionally distant or they, whatever, you know, you want to complain about. It. He abused me, beat me, threw me down and robbed me. Are you going to continue? doesn't mean you don't protect yourself or care for yourself. But when that's over, do you dwell in that kind of loyalty or suffering? Or as the Buddha says, abandon these and move on. Renounce that which causes you suffering and start anew. O nobly born, the Buddhist texts begin, remember who you really are. Remember that you have within you a heart of generosity, of integrity, and of the kind of renunciation, I mean, those kids were struggling to learn it, um, that gives you a centeredness and a, um, and a place of stillness or peacefulness or wisdom that you can reside in with the waves of praise and blame and gain and loss and pleasure and pain that make up human incarnation. And that's the way you become free. So renunciation of things, not of our attachment to them, renunciation of possession of people, renunciation of your fixed views, and renunciation of fear. Gandhi said, fearlessness is the prerequisite 
for a genuine spiritual life. You know, and of course, politics works by trying to scare people. That's, you know, you can say it's contemporary, but it's actually been going on for um, centuries. Uh, and so we have fears of the other and terrorism and racism and all these things sort of intertwine. These people or this circumstance or whatever, you need to be afraid and we'll keep you safe. Um, Fearlessness is that which gives you a whole different level of both, uh, let me see if I can find you, Gandhi. It gives an entirely different level of freedom of heart and spirit. So here's Gandhi standing up to the entire British Empire and they're, you know, throwing him in prison and, and so forth. And he says, if you make unjust laws to keep us suppressed in a wrongful manner without taking us into confidence. These laws will merely adorn the statute books. We will never obey them. Award us what punishment you like. We will put up with it. Send us to prison and we will live there as if in a paradise. Ask us to mount the scaffolding and we will do so laughing. Shower what sufferings you like upon us. We will calmly endure all and not hurt a hair of your body. We would gladly die and will not so much as touch you or harm you. But so long as there is life yet in these bones, we will never comply with your arbitrary laws and we will love you anyway. So that's a statement of somebody who's fearless. And as, as I said, you know, quoting Thomas Jefferson last time, one person with courage is a majority that when we remember fearlessness, it empowers us to live in the way that really brings a happiness to ourselves and to others. So fear is an interesting thing because often it's about what hasn't come yet, you know? It's really about the future, all those stories and thoughts and so forth. Um, And yet, in in fact, um, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Tell me somebody knows what's really going to happen tomorrow. I mean, you have good good guesses, but some days you're wrong, you know. What will happen? So much mystery. What is love? What is gravity? Um, What will happen politically? What will happen, you know, in your family? Um, When will you die? So mysterious. What is consciousness? How did you get to be a human being? People would answer to Sansanim, Zen Master Sansanim, you don't know. He said, ah, oh, good, don't know. Don't you just keep don't know. Don't know. So you look fresh and not with your views. So this is also letting go of your fear and includes the fear that somehow you're going to fail. Because guess what? You will. Anybody who's worth anything and pays attention, you have success and failure. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career, says Michael Jordan. I lost over 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game's winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over again in my life, but I still keep going out on the court. That is why I succeed. So you fail. But fearlessness is not about succeed, success or failure. The freedom of the heart is the ability to enter this world with your care and your love. And that's what brings you happiness. So if you're possessed by fear and controlled by it in some way, you lose, the, the, you lose touch with that freedom that was born into you of who you really are. Looking at stories again. This is from Frank Agostaseski. 
He said, I flew to Berlin to teach a workshop on grief and forgiveness. I didn't mention my experience of having gone to the concentration camps to Birkenau um, prior to leading this workshop. It can still be difficult to speak of such things in Germany. As the workshop was ending a day or two later, however, a woman from the very back of the room stood up and said, I've been listening to you talking about forgiveness, but my father was a prisoner in those concentration camps and I could never forgive his killers. My heart is like ice. The whole room went silent. And again, the only appropriate response was to bear witness, just to hold that with a witnessing heart. And then a woman on the other side of the room raised her hand to speak, and I thought to myself, hmm, now the stories of the camps and the grief of these losses will come. She stood and said, my heart is like ice too. It feels like a stone. My father was a Nazi officer who was a guard in those camps. I know that he killed many people. I can't forgive him. Silence. And then these two women did the bravest thing I've ever seen. They made their way across the large conference hall of 200 people and embraced. They didn't say a word. They didn't have to. They just held each other. Their actions were a clear recognition that they were no longer alone in that pain. And for that moment, their suffering was all of our suffering and their compassion and forgiveness was all of ours. So to let go of fear is somehow to have a bigger vision of the world. Um, Kabir, wonderful poet, writes, where are you, Kabir? <laughs> He's, well, I'll try and remember it. He says, there is, um, we sense that there is some spirit that is born into the animals and plants and trees around us. It's the same spirit that gave life to you in your mother's womb. Why do you walk around feeling that you are an orphan? Don't you remember that you belong to it all? A holy relationship, and a holy relationship means a moment that you hand something to someone or receive it from them or look in their eyes or say a word. A holy relationship is a means of saving time. One instant spent together restores the universe. And you can hear it in that story in Germany. One moment of that kind of attention can turn everything around. And so this kind of renunciation is the renunciation of all the things that hold us back and the willingness to say, as Gandhi, I know what matters to me. Um, And what matters in his case was both justice and love. And I will put neither of them down. I will carry them both in the ways that I best can. And each of you have gifts that you carry to the world so that when we sit and meditate, yes, You quiet the mind. Yes, you open and tend the heart and release things. Yes, you can go into vastness and a sense of connection, all of those things. But then the gift from it is to come back to this world um, with hands that can plant seeds and nourish and water and tend, not because you're supposed to, um, but because it's your family. It's who you are. You, your gift is really your love. Maybe the big renunciation, you know, in our human life is um, the renunciation of the way we thought life was supposed to be and the willingness to love life as it presents itself and then to respond and to add our peace and our gift and our seeds and open ourselves to the sky and the wind and also to the storms and the rain and the mystery of all of it. I could read you, a, and I will, a little poem to end, but 
I'm contemplating whether to tell this story or not, and I guess I will, you know, whatever. Um, so some years ago, I had a friend named Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman, um, who has the same name as the great economist who was at the University of Chicago, very famous conservative economist, my friend Milton Friedman was a speechwriter in the Senate, and then he worked in the White House during, long ago during Jimmy Carter's presidency. And during that particular time, um, there was a very high level of inflation. And oil prices spiked and inflation uh, went up, so you know, interest rates were up in the teens and, and, and 20s and, and so forth. Um, and one day Milton Friedman was there and working on a speech or something, and a phone call came for him. And says, is this Milton Friedman? He says, yes, it is. He says, it turned out it was, a, it was a clergy person in one of the largest church communities in America, this whole very, very large church organization. And he was their financial officer as well as a clergy person. And he was wanting to get some advice about what to do with the billion or however many dollars that the church had to invest, especially in this fraught economic time. So he said, we have this many billions, and you know, I'm calling to see if you have some advice about investment. And my friend Milton Friedman said, have you considered giving it to the poor? <laughs> <laughs> and the man at the uh, on the other end of the line was a little shocked and said, is this the real Milton Friedman? <laughs> you know, to which my friend Milton Friedman paused for a moment and said, is this the real church? <laughs> <laughs> he was a witty fellow, you know. Um, at whatever level that we are, actually, these teachings of what brings happiness to us, the level of integrity that we live with, um, the level of generosity, not because you're supposed to be generous, but because um, it's actually what brings joy and happiness to the heart. Um, and the level of renunciation so that you can, like those little kids in the, uh, in the video and so forth, there are all the storms and pulls of your opinions and others and needs and praise and blame and so forth that you can actually tend your own heart no matter what, and, and uh, you know, you have a rudder on your boat in the stream, and there's some way in which you know how to live um, that through these trainings and practices gives you peacefulness and steadiness and allows you to bring that gift of peacefulness and steadiness to the world that so needs it. So this is from uh, Gensei. Trailing my stick, I go down to the garden gate, Fall, winter floods have washed away the planks of the bridge, shouldering our sanders, sandals we wade across the narrow stream. I dabble in the flow, delighted by the shallowness of the stream, gaze at the flagging, admiring how firm the stones are under the water. The point in life is to know what's enough. Why envy those other world mortals? With the happiness held in one inch square heart, you can fill the whole space between heaven and earth. So let's just sit for a few moments. And as you sit, let yourself reflect. What things is it time to let go of?
to give away, to sell, to offer to the poor, to give to someone else. To release. And what people is it time to release? And what opinions and ideas and views would it help to release, to rest in mystery and a trusting heart? So I thank you for your kind attention and good behavior, yes, and uh, yeah, it's, it's lovely to be able to remind myself, because every time I teach I'm also talking to myself, Jack, yes, listen, remember this, it's good. Um, I hope something of this touches you in a way that's a benefit, and perhaps we'll see you again. Good night. Drive carefully out there on the wet roads. Be polite with one another. It's crowded. Good night.